10 hours of teaching schedule so it's not going to be easy especially so that they have been in hibernation for several months and then all of a sudden you will go to a uh, in the heat of the battle so let's pray that the lord will give them healthy body that uh, they their voice uh, will uh, hold as they teach for nine hours to ten hours every day and that the lord will give them joy as they do this because you know if you know if you enjoy what you're doing then you will not even feel tired of doing that but if you dislike what you're doing even just after the first hour there will be there will already be a dissatisfaction in that and you can feel so many negative things so let's continue to pray for each other our brethren that are sick that the lord will give them continual healing uh, that they will be uh, prepared for tomorrow pray also for wisdom especially for brother jong as he is uh, handling the uh, uh, position of the principle of iq and uh, it's uh, new to him so pray that the lord will give him wisdom that he'll be able to handle it well and give a good christian testimony uh, to the owner and to the uh, teachers that are under him and continue to pray that uh, we'll be able to reach more students for the Lord uh, this year and pray that uh, we can go back to normal next year that our outreaches will be opened and we can go there continue our ministry and we, the Lord will give us wisdom to uh, do things that will really uh, reach the lost to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ so we because of the pandemic so many things uh, went out of balance so let's pray that uh, everything will uh, again go back to normal and uh, we can uh, do the main thing as we continue to minister in the name of the Lord here in Shimrip Cambodia also pray for our missionaries the missionaries that we're supporting it's so sad that we have to stop supporting them for a while but let us pray that come January we'll be able to support them again because uh, so many missionaries are really having a hard time in their field of missions because of lack of finances and uh, some of the churches really have stopped supporting them because of financial constraint that many churches are experiencing so we are really praying that the Lord will bless us so that we can be a channel of blessing to these uh, missionaries let us also pray for those uh, churches that are uh, holding the rope for us here in Cambodia that we may be able to continue serving the Lord through and by his grace shall we stand up and we will pray as we have already read our text for today our father in heaven we are so grateful to you because you've given us another chance to worship you today in spirit and in truth we thank you lord for this liberty that we enjoyed even in this time of pandemic when so many churches are not allowed to gather together in order to worship you that the hearts of many christians who delight in gathering together were not allowed to oh god that gave them so much sadness and pain and misery oh god but we thank you for the continuous freedom that you have given us may we not take it for granted but may we treasure it oh god and thank you for giving us this opportunity that in spite of what is happening in the world we still have this freedom this liberty to gather together and worship you help us lord to know you more to learn about you more that we may serve you more and love you more oh god and that as we continue to live in this world our lives will be surrendered and given to thee and use it lord at your disposal so that your will in our lives and in the lives of other people will be fulfilled help us lord not to be deceived by the devil or any of his tactics oh god that we may swerve from the path that you have prepared for us but give us wisdom lord that we may be able to move forward 
and to continue serving you and worshiping you, O God. Bless us, Lord, as we once again look at your word. Help us, Lord, to be blessed by your word. Help me to be a blessing to your people. Give us, Lord, light, wisdom, and understanding that we may not only learn your word, but eventually, Lord, apply them in our lives. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we have read a very familiar passage in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. So we know that this is the, the fall of man. We know that uh, this is something that happened a long, long time ago, more than 6,000 years ago. But it is very current because if you're going to look at everything that happened here, these are the same things that are happening even now in our time. We can see that the tactic that the devil used in the Garden of Eden is the same tactic that he's using in the very lives of the people of God today in order to uh, distract them from serving the Lord. To plant doubt, see the doubt in, their, in our minds that we may not be able to really put our trust, full trust and confidence in the Lord, in His Word, and in the mighty work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You see, Satan's work is always to destroy what God is building. Satan's work is to imprison those people whom God have already given freedom and liberty. And it is his tactic to keep in prison those who are still lost so that the light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ will never shine in their hearts so that they will die and they will go to hell. So that is the very reason why we need to once again revisit what happened in the Garden of Eden, learn some lessons, and be careful not to fall into the tactics of the devil that he employed in the Garden of Eden until now that caused the fall of man. So, Satan desires that we question the Word of God. And this is the very first thing that he did in the Garden of Eden. So the curtain opens in chapter 3 with Satan possessing the serpent and questioning and attacking the word of God. Satan's first words were poisoning the mind of Eve by planting a seed of doubt. You see, when doubt comes into our mind regarding God and his word, then there is no way that we are going to be effective in serving God. Because if you cannot put your full trust and confidence in something or someone, then you're not going to... Uh, uh, put everything, even your life, to that thing or to that person. That is the reason why Satan wants doubt to come into our mind. And this tactic is found all throughout the scriptures. You see, Satan is a believer of the saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. He says, it worked before, it is working now, and it will continue to work. That is why I'm doing the same thing. And Satan saying that people are so dumb to fall into the same pit over and over and over again. And we may say, why? Because we're in the flesh. Because the bait that Satan is using is something that entices our flesh. That it is as if it is a gravity that is pulling us into its center and there is nothing that we can do or people can do if they're unsaved but those that are saved knew that they can do something but sad to say our flesh is getting the better of us so satan employed this tactic starting in the garden of eden until now and he's not changing his way of temp tempting and enticing men to fall into sin. So, what was the serpent really like before? Because we know the serpent now is a slithering being, uh, crawling uh, through his uh, its uh, belly, 
and, and, and all of these things. So if, if you will see a serpent, except if you are animal lover or uh, loving exotic uh, animals, you will not even appreciate uh, the serpent. You will even run if you will see one. But the Bible says that the serpent was very subtle or cunning. He may have been very beautiful too during the uh, creation in the Garden of Eden. Because the Hebrew word for serpent is nash, nashas. I don't know if I pronounced it right, but nashas, and it means shining, upright creature. So it is shining, beautiful, upright. It's not crawling. Because the only the reason why the serpent is crawling is because that is the curse, the punishment God gave to the serpent the, because he was used by the devil in the Garden of Eden. So he, it was an upright, shining and upright creature. It is possible that the serpent may have walked upright in the Garden of Eden. So let us notice Satan's weapon that he used upon Eve again for a moment. It was the doubting and questioning of the authority and accuracy of God's word. You see, God is perfect. God never commit mistakes. Whatever God said, it is always absolute truth. And if the devil can make us doubt the word of God, then everything will fall down. Then the very foundation will be shaken. The, the very foundation will be destroyed. And if that foundation is destroyed, then we cannot effectively build upon it. So that is why the devil used this tactic to plant a seed of doubt in the mind of Eve about the authority and the accuracy of the word of God. And this is Satan's most effective weapon. You see, as a Baptist, we have our distinctive and we believe that the word of God is our final authority when it comes to faith and practice. But once we start to believe in the philosophies of men, once we start to depend on the traditions of men, once we start to listen to these uh, philosophers of this world, then we are in for a fall. We are setting ourselves for a fall. Because there are so many good sayings, they are good to hear, but they are not according to the truth of the word of God. Amen. And that is why we have to be careful. The world is always saying the universal brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God. That is good to hear because it says that we are one. It is saying that we are all brothers and sisters in the Lord. But the Bible is very clear, contrary to that saying, in John 8, 44, the devil has his children. And God has his children. So it is not true regarding the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of men. It is simply not true. It is paving the way for ecumenism. And ecumenism is against the word of God. So once you believe in the sayings of men that is apart from the truth of the word of God, then you are setting yourself for a fall. That's why we have to be careful to whom we listen, to what we listen, and to the things that we are allowing to be the guide in our lives. You see, doubt brings fear. It brings uncertainty and hesitancy in obeying and believing God. If you have doubt in your calling, how can you be effectively minister to the Lord and to people? If you doubt that is the Lord calling me here in Cambodia and there is doubt, how can you give your best? If you have doubt, is this the right church for me? How can you serve the Lord uh, best in this church if there is doubt in your mind? Is, is the Bible really the word of God? How can you believe the things that the Bible is saying if you have doubt that this is the very word of God? You see, if you believe that even one word from this Bible may not be true, then every word may be that word. And you cannot just give everything into it because of the doubt that is hovering in our minds. So when we doubt or question God, 
we have a tendency to take matters into our own hands. And that will really mess things up. Because if you cannot believe the Bible, whom are you going to believe? Then the tendency is to believe yourself or to believe other people. Try to, to ask advice from other people apart from the Word of God. There's nothing wrong with asking advice. As long as you're asking advice uh, on those people that believe firmly on the Word of God. The, the uh, uh, brother Alex empathically uh, said a while ago that if a person is not living according to the word of God, don't even ask advice from him. Because what is he going to tell you? If he is not a firm believer and, a, and not practicing the word of God in his or her life. You see, many Christians do not read and study God's word because they doubt the word of God. Because if you believe that the word of God is really true, absolute truth, and it is really the word of God, then you will definitely be interested as a child of God to know God more by studying his word. So that you will know the, uh, know the answer to the many questions in life that until now people are trying to find out. Why am I here? Where did I come from? What is the purpose of my existence in this world? You see, all the philosophers have so many uh, theories regarding these things and hypotheses regarding these things, but if you will go to the Word of God, then you will understand that God is always absolute in His Word, that we are created in the image and the likeness of God so that we, as God's creation, will live a life that will glorify our God. That's the reason why God created us. That is the reason why God saved us. That is the reason why the Holy Spirit is empowering us so that in everything we do, it will redound to the glory of God. Whatsoever we do, whether you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do it for the glory of God. And that is what we must do in life. So if you know the Word of God, then you know the answer to those questions regarding our existence here on earth. You see, defeated believers claim that Bible principles don't really work or apply to their lives. They will even say that the Bible is already uh, antique. It does not apply in our time today. It is like young people saying, there is a generation gap. You do not understand us because you live in antiquity. And we are living in a modern time, a modern age. You are in the time of uh, bows and arrows, and we are living in the time of missiles and all of these things. IT, and they, they will uh, uh, say everything in order to prove that there is a misunderstanding between them and us. And these people are also going to do everything because of the authorship of Satan that the Bible is really not applicable in our time today because it is already obsolete. But ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is not only current. It, is, it even shows us what will happen in the future. Amen? It is always updated. It is always relevant in our time because the author of the Word of God is the great I Am, the ever present God. Amen? Who always lives in the present. So, if this attitude describes you, well, the principles, the Bible, and the principles of the Bible is not applicable in my life, then Satan is winning a victory in your life. The result is you will become unstable and waver back and forth in your spiritual life and become ineffective in making your life count for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Satan knows that he cannot touch our salvation. If you are saved, if we are saved, we are eternally secured. And there is nothing that Satan can do to get our salvation, to make us lose our salvation because we are secured in the hands of God. So what Satan will do is to make us ineffective in serving the Lord. Because by doing that, many people will not be given a chance 
to hear a clear presentation of the word of God or of the gospel that will give them uh, salvation from the Lord or he will destroy our testimony that no matter how we say the word of God people will never listen because of the life that we are living that is far from the truth of the word of God so he wants to make us miserable defeated and a Christian with no good testimony so that whatever we say or whatever we do will not have an impact in the lives of the lost so let us look at the uh, passage that we have read and first let us look at the serpent in the fall the serpent in the fall so the work of Satan in the fall was front and center it is uh, it have all the imprint of the working of Satan he opposes the work of God and no sooner had made man that was put in the garden of Eden then right after God created man and placed man in the garden of Eden then Satan showed up to create havoc in that peaceful garden why because Satan cannot stand the work of God the work of God is always good and godly and Satan is always opposed to anything that is good and to anything that is godly he will always try to destroy the work of God and if he cannot destroy it he is going to uh, join it in order to destroy it within or if he cannot do it then he is going to make his own copy in order to put doubt in the minds of people that are looking at the working of the Lord like the Lord established the church and then Satan established his own churches and if you're going to number it the churches that Satan established will outnumber the churches that the Lord Jesus Christ had established there are many false churches than true churches in our time there are many churches that are teaching a false gospel than churches that are preaching the true gospel of from the word of God why because he is always there to oppose that's why he was called anti-christ he will he is always opposed to God anti-christ anti-god anti-holy spirit whatever God will do he is trying to destroy from without from within or is going to copy it in order to corrupt the image of anything that God has created so the tactics of Satan are most evident in our text and I have said a while ago he never changed it because it is effective don't change something that is effective but sad to say it is in the negative sense when Satan is the one doing it number one we can see that he used deceit verse number one he used deceit the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had had made so Satan used the serpent who was then a beautiful creature to attack he disguised himself in that which was very attractive and appealing because no temptation can ever work if the bait is not attractive to the person being baited if it is not appealing enticing to the person that is being baited that's why the apostle paul in second corinthians 11 14 to 15 says that no marvel for satan himself is transformed into an angel of light so you see not everything that is good to hear not everybody that is standing behind the pulpit not everybody that is using the word of God is actually a minister of God many of them in fact most of them are ministers of the devil because even he transformed himself into an angel of light and verse 15 and the Bible says therefore it is no great thing it is common it is easy if it ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness 
whose end shall be according to their works that is why in matthew it is very clear when the lord jesus christ says not not everyone that calleth unto me lord lord shall enter into the kingdom of god many will say unto me in those days have i not preached in your name have we not cast out evil spirit in your name have we not performed wonderful works miracles in your name but jesus will tell them i never knew you depart from me ye that work iniquity you see the devil knew that we are a very impressionable people that whenever we see act of righteousness we're going to fall for it without any hesitation without any question without any doubt and that is the reason why the devil is using that in order to entice us to believe something that is not true you see many things that made people for satan's tactics are those that are appealing attractive and enticing like money is money not attractive is money not appealing is it not enticing you see at the sight of money at the sight of gold people are ready to abandon everything that is moral in order to amass of this wealth how many people killed each other for money how many families were broken because of money how many cases do we have that involve embezzlement of money people's lives people's morality being destroyed because of the shining gold that satan is brandishing in the sight of the people of god and he's using it in order to perpetually imprison the lost in this world that's why the bible says the love of money is the root of all evil it's enticing it is appealing it is attractive not only that sex is sex not enticing is it not appealing is it not attractive it is not something that is enjoyable so you will use that in order to be the people of god and many times we are going to fall for it and not realizing that a few minutes of joy will effectively destroy our lives in this world as we live thank god if you are saved after this life in heaven those things will not uh, be remembered anymore we are not going to do it anymore but we can destroy what god is doing that is good in our lives if we are going to fall for the temptation of the devil we thank god because he is a gracious god and he will give us chance after chance after chance until the time that we will tell god no lord i, I really do not need the chance because i will continually plunge myself into this hideous thing that the devil is offering me popularity oh my since the uh, this uh youtube thing this technology thing that we can post almost everything in the internet you know people are using everything just to become popular like tiktoking doing crazy weird things just to become popular how many times do do we uh, have a conversation that what, what can we do so that we can put something on youtube that will become viral so that we will have uh, more uh, clicks and uh, followers and likes and so that we can monetize and then we can earn income there's nothing wrong in uh you know if you want uh, to have an income to help your family uh, to be a part of uh, the ministry of the lord and, and all of these things nothing wrong with that but you can see that people are willing to do almost everything just to become popular 
Actually, I suggested to them, if you really want to become popular and want things to be viral, well, like for example, uh, the truth that hurts. And then try to saw your eyes close on YouTube. And then explain to them what you're experiencing. And then after that, try to cut the, uh, you know, the, the string that you use. People will do everything. Why? Popularity. They want to become uh, popular. They want to become uh, uh, the uh, talk of the town. They will do everything in order to become popular. They will do everything in order to have power, to have power, to stay in power. Why? Because of the promise of satisfaction when the truth of the matter is you may have everything in this world, but if you will die without Christ, you will die without hope, and everything that you have will be lost, will be forgotten, and you will be in hell forever. What shall it profit a man? And yet the devil has become very, very successful in making us major on vain things of this world and not mind the things of the Lord that will last all throughout eternity. You see, Satan will always promise an enjoyable, enjoyable and satisfying experience in all the baits that he is offering, but he will never tell you about the dire consequence if you will bite the bait that Satan is giving. So deceit. Do not be deceived by the devil. Know the word of God. And you will avoid being deceived by false teachings and false doctrine. Another thing is doubt. Yea, hath God said, casting doubt on the word of God. So one of Satan's favorite tactics is to cast doubt on the word of God. If you do not have confidence in the word, it will not be your guide. Why? Because you do not trust it. You, do, you have doubt if this is really the word of God. So if I have doubt, if this is God's word, why will I consult this, especially in the many major decisions of my life? So I'm going to make others as my authority than the word of God. And Satan will offer you many people that you can become your authority apart from the word of God. That's why some people go to psychologists. Some people talk to priests, to pastors, to ministers. Some people talk to their professors asking for advice regarding important decisions in life when the truth of the matter is that all of our major decisions and even minor must always be based on the word of God because the word of God is sure. It will never lead us astray. You see, Satan wants something other than the word guiding our lives. Like man's philosophy. Do you remember our study at the book of Colossians? What entered the churches at Colossae that make these people doubt the word of God? Number one, intellectualism. Because the Greeks, they love wisdom. So they are telling the churches, the Christians at, at Colossae, that Jesus and the gospel is not enough because it is so simple. You need more. You need knowledge. Not only intellectualism, but ritualism. And then, mysticism. And then, asceticism. All of this entered in order to make people depend on them other than the word of God. Because the devil knew as long as you will not consult the word of God, it does not make any difference who you consult. Many people are consulting the stars. Horoscope. If the stars, the stars is not allowing me to do this thing. This year will be the year that I am going to find a husband or a wife according to the stars. You see, the stars cannot speak. 
the stars cannot guide your life. It may be able to guide you in navigation, but never in navigating your life. Our only guide must only be the Word of God because it is the light unto our path. It will show us where to go and where we are going and it will show us the path of the Lord. So there is the uh, humanistic philosophy, horoscope, superstitious belief, religion, and the wisdom of man. So he gets the word of God removed from our homes, from our school, from our government, and he de-emphasized the word of God in our churches. That is why many churches prided themselves of their programs than the preaching of the word of God. I do not know. There is a popular preacher. I forgot who he is. But he has a post. And he's very popular that he said, in our church we do not teach doctrine because it gets in the way of evangelism. We do not have any Bible study because it gets in the way of evangelism. We do not teach the word of God because it gets in the way of evangelism. If you want the word of God explained to you, then you are a lazy fat Christian and you do not belong in our church because we solely do evangelism in this church. You see, evangelism is good. That is the main thing. That is a very important thing. But to tell people doctrine is not important, to tell people Bible study is not important, to tell people that anything that is associated with God except from evangelism is not important, it's like putting a bit of poison in the food that you're eating. Remember, a little leaven, leaven it the whole lump. And that is what they're doing. That is what Satan is doing. He will tell you this is good and he may be right, but he will put a little poison, a little error that will mess everything up if we are not careful. So he removed the word of God in the churches and emphasize programs. That is why churches are priding themselves in the number of their people because this is how we do it. We have our bus routes. We have our uh, Sunday school, bringing Sunday school to the people. We have all of this program. That's why we now have the uh, highest number of attendance compared to any church in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, these are just numbers. What's important in the Lord is our heart that is beating for the glory of God. I'm not saying that we should be small in number, but what's important is that there is quality in our service and our worship in the Lord. And if there is quality, numbers will follow, but in a qualitative way. So that's why we have to be careful and always base everything in the Word of God. So many churches now are busy in fighting social injustice. There is nothing wrong in trying to correct social injustice, but that is not the very reason why the Lord established the church. We are here for spiritual battle, not physical battle. We are here to go into all the world and preach the gospel, to every creature, no matter what you do, there will always be poor people in this world. Do you remember when this woman bro uh, breaks that bottle of spikenard and anoint the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ and Judah saw it and he said, if it was sold, it can feed so many poor people and then the Lord rebuke him and he tell he told him you have the poor always with you but not the lord jesus christ there is a reason why god established the church and there is a purpose why we are here because we are to be the missionary and soul winning station in this world yes we should not contribute to social injustice from time to time we may do something about it but that is not the main reason why we are here. And if we will make that the main thing, then we totally miss the mark 
of being a local New Testament church. You see, everything that we do that uses the power of the flesh and not the power of the Holy Spirit is not of the Lord. No matter how good you think it may be, what is important is, is it according to the will of God? That is the question that we must always answer whenever we do something for God. You see, some people will say, I, I, I do not attend the, the local church, but wherever I am, I worship the Lord. So what's wrong with that? I said there's nothing wrong with worshiping the Lord wherever you are. But there is something wrong because you are forsaking the assembling of the local church together. And that is something that God wants to happen. And that is something that God wants to see so that the world will see that we are united in love. And if we are united in love, then the world will believe that we are really the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That is why whenever you are absent, whenever we are gathered together, you are given a testimony that what we're doing is not important. That this gathering is not worth our salt. That what we are doing every time we are together is not important in the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, United Nations may gather, Senate may gather, Congress may gather, but I am going to tell you this, that there is no more important gathering than the gathering of the people of God worshiping and studying the Word of God. That's the most important gathering in the sight of God. And we also must give uttermost importance to that. That is why he says, not forsaking. But if you doubt the word of God, how could you believe that? How could you do that? Well, maybe that's not how God meant it to be. You know, sometimes we are our own authority in interpreting the word of God. And we always interpret it according to our own benefit. Ladies and gentlemen, let the word of God be the word of God. And if we will do that and obey God, then we are going to live a life that is pleasing unto him. Not only deceit, not only doubt, but he used discontent. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. You see, Satan focuses on the negative. He focuses on the restrictions. You see, how many trees do you think there are in the Garden of Eden? Let's just say 100. And God said, you can eat the fruit of the 99, not this one. And yet Satan focuses on that one and told Eve that God is withholding what will make you happy. And you see, that's our problem. You may put a big blackboard and put a dot and people will notice the dot and not the whole board. That's our problem. That's why in your life, for 20 years you have a friend, you do good things to that friend for 19 years, 364 days. And one day, you did something wrong. And it will destroy everything and he or she will focus on that one day that you did something wrong. That is the flesh. That is our nature. That is the reason why when God saved us, he created a new creature in us. So that it should be the one to live. And it will live according to the word of God. Amen? Because you cannot fix the old nature. There is no fixing it. It's corrupt. It is depraved. You cannot fix it. There must be a new man. That's why the Bible says, put off, mortify, and then put on. Let the new creature live in us. But discontent, he focuses on the burdens, not the blessings. 
That's what the devil will do. He will make you look at the burdens and not the blessings that God is giving us. He would make you discontent with your God-appointed situation. You see how many people are complaining because they are poor. But they are not realizing that compared to so many people in the world, they are so blessed by God. He said, I've been in America for several times. And I have talked to many Christians who realized and said, My brother, we are complaining of our circumstance and situation here in America. And then we realize that compared to all the world, we are better off are done two-thirds of the world's population even though we consider ourselves poor here in america well because you focus on the burdens not on the blessing you see there, there was a saying i complain about not having shoes on my feet until i saw a person who have no feet at all satan will make you focus on the burden he will make you discontent with your God appointed situation. He does not focus on the positives. Why? He does not focus on the privileges because if we will focus on the positive, our faith will grow stronger and we will be more thankful and grateful and loving to God and it will inspire us in loving Him more that will result us in serving God more in our lives. Listen to me. Focus on your salvation. Focus that our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Focus on our assurance of heaven. Focus on that we are co-heir of the Lord Jesus Christ. Focus in our mansion in heaven. Focus that we are a recipient of God's promise, protection, provision, power, providence, presence. And one day, no matter how hard it is in this world, when we die, we will be in heaven and we will enjoy the presence of God forever focus on that and you will be grateful to the Lord but we, we complain always we focus on the negative and that is what Satan is, t- is steering us to do he is steering us to go there because a discontent Christian will never be a powerful Christian in serving the Lord so let us focus you see the song encourages us count your blessings name them one by one count your blessings and see what the lord has done count your blessings name them one by one count your many blessings see what god has done my brother you understand what i'm saying do not focus on the negative it will discourage you Thank God that among so many millions of people in the world you are chosen and you are called by God. Amen. What a privilege. I believe if, if Prime Minister Hun Sen will come here and he will point his finger at, at Liang and said, Liang, I, I want you to do this for me. I want you to be in this position for me. Liang will be very, very proud. But the one who called us and chose us is not the Prime Minister of Cambodia, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. And that should be enough in order for us to serve God and to give this life at the disposal of God. Because one day we are going to be with Him. And while we are waiting for that day, He already promised us that He will never leave us nor forsake us then denial he says ye shall not surely die satan likes to deny the certainty and practice of divine judgment therefore satan says that hell is a joke and sin is not punished by god he says that a loving god will not send a soul in hell that comes from Satan God is love and because God is love he will not send anybody to hell you see when the certainty of punishment is removed 
sin will increase. Well, if there is no hell, if there is no payment for my sin, then I will just do whatever I want to do. Because anyway, when I die, that's it. But the Bible is very clear. It is appointed that the man wants to die. And after this, the judgment. You see, the perverted emphasis on the love of God to the exclusion of His holiness and judgment encourages denial of judgment upon sin. But ladies and gentlemen, always understand and realize this. That God sent His Son to die an agonizing death. A death unknown to all men, to many, many men. The agony that he experienced even before that day, when he agonized in the Garden of Gethsemane, that sweat and blood came out of, that, of him because of the prospect that he is going to experience on that day. Plus the shameful, agonizing death that he experienced on that cross. Why? Because God cannot condone sin. Sin must be punished. And if God allowed His Son to die because of sin, how much more we if we will reject His Son? You see, remember in the Old Testament, God commanded the annihilation of tribes or nations and people because He cannot allow sin to continue. How is it that so many people believe that after all the evil things that they have done their whole life, they will still die and go to heaven? Because God is love. And His love will not allow us to go to hell and be punished forever. And forever that is the preaching of the devil it is not the preaching of the Bible and it is not from the Word of God amen God requires repentance and faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can escape that agonizing penalty in hell and we will receive forgiveness and the gift of eternal life then dishonor verse number five God that know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Satan dishonors God all he can. He would make God cruel, unfair, and too restrictive. He is going to paint God as an unjust person and fair that he does not want our happiness and our joy and that he is withholding something good from us so that we are not going to experience the joy of all these things so satan will lie to dishonor god you see the first lie comes from satan he is the author of lies he is the father of lies if something begins from you you are the author or the father of it look at john 8 44. the scripture is very clear when it says regarding the devil ye are of your father the devil and the last of your father ye will do he was a murderer from the beginning and about not in the truth because there is no truth in him when he speaketh a lie he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it he is the father of lies that's why when you say you're the father of first fruits you're lying because first fruits is already in the bible even before you were born and if you have a version of first fruits that you fathered it is not of god it is of the devil and you use it for your own benefit and trying to deceive the people of God. You know, Satan will always lie. There was this story, of course, this is not a true story, but a story nevertheless. That in hell, 
there is Satan, his son, and his father. Satan is a father. So, while in hell, the uh, grandfather and the grandson are talking. I oh, know the, the the Satan and the son is talking, and the son, and Satan told the son, "You know, we are the most powerful in the universe. We are almighty. Nobody can defeat us. We can do everything that we want because we have no equal." And of course, the son believed his father. So the son said, I'm going to earth, and I'm going to wreak havoc in that place. And he went to earth, and they see people, ten people, and he's really being successful. But then he saw a spiritual Christian led by the Holy Spirit. And he tried to deceive, and he tried to defeat, but he was defeated by that Christian because that Christian fought in the name of the Lord, not in his own flesh. So when he was de defeated, he was humiliated and he was very angry and he went back to hell and he's looking for his father and he said, Satan, Satan, where are you? Satan, show your face to me. Satan, where are you? But Satan was not there. He's busy in Vatican trying to talk to the Pope. So the grandfather sleeping heard, heard the grandson and said, Hey, what's all this fuss? He said, I'm looking for my father. He said, why? Because he told me that we have no equal, that we are powerful, and we can defeat everybody. I went to earth, and I was defeated by a Christian. Well, you're foolish. Why? Why do you have to believe your father? Don't you know that your father is a liar? And Satan will even lie to his children. How much more to the children of God. Amen? So we have to be careful. He is the father of lies. He originated lies. The first lie from Satan, he attacks God's ability to carry out judgment. Satan told Eve, ye shall not surely die. But when Eve disobeyed God and Adam disobeyed God, immediately they died and were separated from God. Amen? Whatever Satan will tell you, don't believe it. There is always a lie hidden in everything that he will say. Lying, lying causes problems for the one who lies and the person lied to. So there is an effect to both people when lie is at hand. Look at Proverbs 6.17. This is God's attitude towards lying. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. If you will read, before this, these are the things that God hates. So God hates lying. If you are lying, then you are showing the character of the devil, and you're not showing the character of God. But if we are honest, we are showing godly character in our lives. Look at Proverbs 12, 22. Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. You see, if you are lying, you are abominable in the sight of God. Karumal dumal. Sa harapan ng ating Panginoon. Look at Jeremiah 7, 4. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are this. So God is telling us to trust not in lying words, but to trust in honest words. And we are commanded in Ephesians 4.25 by the Lord. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 25, Wherefore putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So lying is something that God hates. An abomination in the sight of God. And God wants lying to be not a part of the life of his children. Satan makes promises that he cannot keep. When Satan told you that if you will have money, then everything will be okay, do not believe him. Because ask Solomon what money brought him. 
as Solomon, what women brought him, as Solomon, what wine caused in his life, as Solomon, that many wives and concubines have done in his life. Imagine three, uh, 300 wives or 700? 700 wives and 300 concubines. If you will meet them once uh, every day, then you need to have more than three years before meeting them again. How hard it is. Maybe he doesn't even know that some are, of them are his wives. And imagine this. Every Christmas and New Year, you have to send at least 2,000 cards to your in-laws. For having a thousand wives and concubines. When Satan promised something, do not believe it. Because Satan is a person who never delivers. He will promise you good things, but you will end up with bad things. He promised that their eyes will be opened and they will be as gods. So their eyes were opened, but eventually closed forever in death. And then they did not become gods. Wisdom is never attained by disobeying the word of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 1.7 Christians need to be careful to whom, to whom they listen and to get good counsel. Make sure your counsel, guidance, or advice is always scriptural. Be careful of your companions that you keep they by day the wrong kinds of the wrong kind of friends can destroy you spiritually Eve received her guidance from satan and it ruined the human race her act the act of adam effectually and effectively ruined the human race and then as we end let us look at the factors in this temptation we have to know this in verse number 6, the last verse, verse number 6, this is a foundation because it contains the factors involved in the first temptation, in the first failure, and in the first sin of the human race. Let us first go to 1 John 2.16 as we look at this. 1 John 2.16, the Bible there is very clear. And this is a reference to what happened in the Garden of Eden. For all that is in the Word, the last of the flesh, the last of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the Word. And therefore, it is of the devil. So the first factor or element is what we call the last of the flesh. It sees that this tree is good for food, appealing to her flesh. It positioned herself to fall. She would have steered clear of that Three. The command is very clear. You can eat of every tree except that one. Why do you still have to go near that tree? Why? It was already commanded. Don't go there. And yet you went there. What do you expect? Blessing? What do you expect? Joy? What do you expect? Happiness? Well, maybe Eve is curious. Don't you know that it was curiosity that killed the cat? He should. She should have not been there in the first place. But she was there. So she set up herself for a fall. You know, our problem is the same. We struggle with sin because we make provision for it to fulfill the last thereof, according to Romans 13, 14. The Bible says that we must abstain from all appearance of evil. You see, sometimes you already know that drinking wine is not good. It is against the will of God. And yet, you see friends drinking and you will still stay there, talk to them anyway. I will not drink. I will just talk to them and share the word of God. They have another spirit. How can you share to them the word of God? Pambira, mag-share ka ng gospel, iniinom, markang demonyo. You cannot, you cannot, 
share the word of God to them, the Bible is very clear that we should not throw purse to the swine. There is a right time that we can share the word of God to them, but not during that time. Why? Because they are preoccupied in drinking. And when you get there, they will ask you to drink. Oh no, pastor, I will not drink. But they will persuade you to do it. Well, pastor, I will hold the glass, but I will not drink. Just hold it. They said, drink. No, I do not drink. I'm a Christian. Or just put the, uh, the lip of the, uh, the, the cup to your lips. You don't have to drink it. But you're smelling it. And you are wetting your appetite. And then therefore they said, why don't you sip it? No, I'm not going to drink. It's not drinking. It's only sipping. So you will sip a little. And then a little. And then a little. And then later you say, one more. And then you will fall into the sin. Why? Because you should not be there in the first place. Amen. If it is your weakness, don't go near it. Even if it is not your weakness, if it has the appearance of evil, don't go near it. Why? Because we should not set ourselves for a fall. But Eve went there and she saw the beauty of that fruit. He desired of that fruit. And he fulfilled the lust of her flesh. She saw to the flesh and therefore he ripped, she ripped corruption. Eve ruined her life because she sowed to her flesh. The lust of the flesh. Next, the lust of the eye. The Bible says the tree was pleasant to the eyes. The lust of our eyes leads to impurity. Look at Matthew 5, 28. That's why sometimes we say, Oh, poor blind people. Don't you know sometimes they're much blessed than us because they could not see evil. But we can. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to last after her had committed adultery with her already in his heart. So whatever enters our eyes, will eventually go to our heart and what is in our heart will eventually come out into the open so we need to guard our eyes amen look at what happened to lot in genesis 13 14 can we go there and the lord said unto abram after that lot was separated from him leap up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward but Lot lift up his eyes in the plain of Sodom and saw that it was a good place and he pitched his tent towards Sodom and Gomorrah so Lot's downfall was accelerated as he lifted up his eyes and chose the plains of Sodom that is why we need to be careful where to look. Look at Potiphar's wife. She cast her eyes upon Joseph. And she decided him. Genesis 39, 7. He saw Joseph. That Joseph was handsome. We saw those ladies and those ladies were beautiful. And lust came into our heart. And then we desire. And whatever we conceive in our mind, later on we will do in our action so we have to be careful what we watch she said lie with me why because joseph is attractive joseph is handsome joseph has a good testimony and the wife of potiphar was attracted because she saw she looked at Joseph with a lustful desire. And those things happen. You see, Lot, when he went to Sodomist Gomorrah, his Nasilot, his Nagkalot, his testimony, Nagkaroon ng Peklot, in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's why in heaven, when you see him, you will say to him, Belot. Why? Because he was not careful 
Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Especially whenever we use the internet. You can easily look at naked people in the internet. You can easily read things that you should not be reading over the internet. That's why we have to be careful what we watch, where we look in using our eyes. And then, the pride of life. Eve desired the tree to make herself wise. You see, it is very foolish to even believe that a fruit can make you wise. But by simply eating that fruit, you're going to become a wise person. She desired to be like God, as Satan did. She appealed to her pride and won. Why? Because Satan fell to his own pride. And Satan is saying, if I fell for it, then everybody will also fall for it. So pride was the sin of the angels of heaven, and pride was the sin that caused the fall of man. You see, the men of the Tower of Babel, they wanted to make them for themselves a name. And their pride corrupted them. In Genesis chapter 11, verse number 4. Ham's pride caused him to brag about seeing his father's nakedness. In Genesis chapter, chapter 9, verse number 22. The pride of Jacob's sons motivated them to destroy Joseph. In Genesis 37, 20. And the pride of Potiphar's wife compelled her to sexually conquer Joseph, but she failed. In Genesis 39.10 Our pride will destroy us and cause us to fail. In Proverbs 16.18 Can we go there please? Pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. Remember James 4.6 God resisted the proud but give it grace unto the humble. You see, pride will do you several things. It will make you contempt and reject the word of God. It will cause contention. It will make you to believe and cheat yourself. And it will make you crazy and wrathful in your life. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, we must be wise in our choices in life. Whatever choices we may face in life, please make this as our authority. Your job, career, training up your children, living our lives, what to do with our lives, what is the will of God, how are we going to be a mighty part of God's work, how to be a blessing in the church of God. We all have it in here. And let us never doubt the word of God, but always make the word of God as the final authority in our life. How can we avoid falling to many temptations in life? We must be saturated by the word of God. Study the word of God. Meditate upon it. Understand it. Obey it. And the word of God will give us wisdom that we need to avoid temptation. For we will learn from the word of God that in Christ we are already complete. And we do not need the fruit of that tree. We do not need to be satisfied by the lust of the flesh. We do not need to be satisfied by the lust of the eyes. And we do not need to be satisfied by the pride of life because we are complete in Jesus. And because we have Jesus, we do not need anything else. And if we are complete in Him, we must make Him preeminent in everything in our life. And if we are going to do that, then we will focus our eyes upon Jesus. And we will see His wonderful grace. And the things of earth will, slow, will uh, fade away. It will grow dim in the light of His glory and grace. Instead of looking at the bait that Satan is presenting unto us, let us focus and keep our eyes 
on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the author, the finisher of our faith. Shall we stand up, please? Every head's bowed. We saw the events that transpired more than 6,000 years ago in the Garden of 